everyone. My name is Cody Barnes, and I am a postdoctoral researcher here at Utah State University. I'm excited to present today about corn and spider mites. So starting off, integrated pest management, or IPM, is a stepwise approach to pest management that combines accurate knowledge of the pests and the level of potential harm with multiple tactics to prevent, reduce, or eliminate pests. By using an IPM program, resistance may be avoided because other management strategies and tactics are reducing the reliance on pesticides. The general categories for an IPM program are identification, prevention, monitoring, and the consideration of multiple tactics to use for management of a pest. Thinking broadly, spider mites are in the class Arachnida, which um, you might recognize thinking of many of the eight-legged little bugs like spiders, ticks, scorpions, etc. And they're contained within the order that also includes mites and ticks or the Kari. So spider mites can mature and reproduce rather rapidly, particularly at warmer temperatures. Below, I have included the general life cycle of spider mites from the egg through the adults. So from the egg, the development goes through several larval stages, nymph stages, and then there's maturity to either the male or the female, where the male is uh, arrowhead shaped while the female is much more round. Here in Utah, we have two main spider mites. And the first one is the Banks grass mite, which feeds primarily on grasses like corn, for example. On the other side of things, there's the two-spotted spider mite, which is a rather extreme host generalist. So you can see it on corn, you might also see it in your garden, and on a number of other plants. Both of these spider mites thrive under warm, dry conditions. And also, both of these mites start feeding from the lower leaves um, of the corn and work their way up as the infestation progresses. Preventative methods for the spider mite outbreaks can include uniform watering, removal of weeds, and also reducing fertilization. So where the watering comes into play is to wash off the spider mites from the leaf surfaces. And they also can serve to cool the leaf surfaces uh, to avert those um, nice, warm, dry conditions that the spider mites thrive under. Removing those weeds can also eliminate the alternative host for those spider mites. And lastly, reducing that excess fertilization can reduce the nitrogen, which is converted to uh, protein and is used for growth by spider mites. So we don't want that either. And moving forward through a monitoring um, schedule, I'm including an example here given from the um, USU extension, uh, one of the fact sheets. So uh, spider mites themselves uh, are very small, but using a dusting technique or blowing a little bit of dust throughout the leaf can help you visualize the amount of silk that's laid by spider mites. Now, spider mites feed by piercing and sucking out the nutrients rather than chewing up the plants. And uh, spider mite outbreaks can also be seen in the stripling of leaves or those yellowish or tan spots that you can see here in the bottom uh, image. So the yellow and brown. And with enough of this damage, spider mites can also cause the leaves to fall the stalks to break and the kernels to shrink. So in those nice warm dry conditions, there can be rather noticeable effects in the cornfields. 
So to keep an eye on these spider mite uh, outbreaks, uh, you can randomly collect leaves from within the first corn row and then work your way outwards uh, at 6, 12, 18, and 24 feet from edge. And now spider mites live typically on the underside of leaves. So examine the underside of the leaves and check for that yellowish or tannish spotting. And also keep an eye out for the webbing and perhaps the mites themselves. Some of them you might be able to see either with your eye or with a, a little hand lens. And repeat this process about every 10 days, then uh, about every two to three days, beginning two weeks before that corn starts tasseling. You can also see on the left a typical corn field versus the one on the right, or I guess it would be the center here where the, the bottom leaves are starting to brown, starting to curl up and uh, uh, deteriorate. That would be one possible um, effect of the spider mites. And you can see in that far right image that on the underside of leaves, uh, often the spider mites are close to that center column and you can see yellowish uh, tan spotting there. So thinking of the tactics to employ to fight sputter mite outbreaks, uh, the first tactic I'll go over here is acaricides or a specific type of pesticides um, that can be used for uh, spider mites. In this box, we see that there are several pesticides on the market for targeting different life stages of spider mites, and many of these use different modes of action. More information about the application for these acaricides can be found in the link shown at the bottom of the slide, um, which goes to the Utah Pest Fact Sheet and has quite a bit more detail than I can cover today. But in brief, a couple precautions are that it's good practice to treat only when strictly necessary and switch between products with different modes of action as the potentially quick generation time and high fecundity of spider mites means that resistance can occur. Also, phytotoxic effects like plant burn can occur from using uh, pesticides and it's important to weigh that consequence also. Another tactic is the use of uh, biological controls and many biological controls persist naturally in cornfields. For example, predatory mites are teardrop shaped and shown here at the top in letters A and B, while pest spider mites are more roundish shaped. The predatory mites are typically also moving much faster and you might even see them feeding on some of the uh, the pest mites. Some of the other typical predators of spider mites are lady beetle larvae and a few others that have some rather fierce names like spider mite destroyers and pirate bugs. It's worth noting that the misuse or overuse of pesticides can impact these beneficial predator populations, many of which likely have lower resistance compared to the spider mites and possibly other pests in the field. I'd like to now spend a little bit of time going over the research on spider mites and corn that we do here at USU. A few of the major themes that we're investigating are the growth of different corn varieties, the effects of irrigation amounts, and comparisons between different spider mite species. The studies that I'll cover today largely took place at the USU Research Greenhouse and Greenville Research Station. We have other studies on the effects of different irrigation technologies, the roles of biocontrols and physiology of spider mites, but discussion of those will uh, likely be outside the time frame for today's talk. In the backdrop and uh, providing much of the precedence for our research is drought and drought is anticipated to intensify across much of the United States within the century, particularly here in the arid west. Water scarcities 
predicted to have significant impacts not only upon crop production, but also their agriculture pests. For the first study that I'll cover today, we hypothesized that drought tolerant corn hybrids and optimal irrigation would result in reduced banks grass mite abundance due to leaf temperatures being lower. To test this hypothesis, we used 10 different hybrids from three commercial companies, which varied in two levels of drought tolerance. We also tested the hypothesis at two levels of irrigation. And we tested this in 2015 and 2016 at the Research Greenhouses and Greenville Research Station. And the results of this study were recently published in Journal of Economic Entomology. The key conclusions that we drew from the experiment were that fewer spider mites persisted on the drought tolerant hybrids compared to the drought susceptible hybrids under water stress. And there didn't seem to be a compromise under optimal irrigation conditions. Also, similar to other studies, we didn't really find that corn hybrid types differed in their leaf temperatures, but there was a reduction um, in those temperatures that uh, sort of spur uh, spider mite outbreaks under those optimal irrigation. So the water um, optimal irrigation reduced that leaf temperature. And expanding on that experiment, we performed a field cage study at Utah State University Greenville Research Station this previous summer, testing if those findings are also pertinent to the management of two spotted spider mites. So by doing a cage study, we sought to eliminate or at least reduce some of those um, side effects of predators and other factors that could um, alter our interpretations of those key hypotheses. Similar to previous work, mites were introduced in this experiment and then counted after two weeks. And the basic experimental design for this experiment was testing one drought tolerant corn hybrid versus its drought susceptible counterpart. We also established two levels of irrigation then we introduced and monitored outbreaks in three pest treatment groups, two spotted spider mites, banks grass mites, and a treatment with no mites. And we replicated each combination of drought tolerance, irrigation, and mites five times. What we found was that fewer mites were present on drought tolerant then drought susceptible corn during water stress. As you can see in the water stressed column in that left chart there. So in orange, the drought susceptible corn variety with spider mites was higher than the drought tolerant under that water stress. And teasing apart that trend, in the chart on the right, the B and T stand for banks, no mites, or two spotted spider mites. The DS and DT represent the drought susceptible and drought tolerant. And lastly, H and L represent either the high irrigation or the low irrigation. So what this shows or is attempting to demonstrate is that the outbreaks in banks grass mites in the high irrigation drought tolerant hybrid and low irrigation drought susceptible hybrid treatments were driving that trend. And those are shown in those yellow highlighted bars. And thinking towards the future, we anticipate that an important next step will be to compare spider mite outbreaks during hot dry years versus cool, wet years. And last year, for example, was a very hot, dry year, but the efficacy of different corn varieties and irrigation practices in averting those spider mite outbreaks should also be tested um, against those cool, moist years to get a much broader picture, I think. And thinking 
a little bit further about the broader implications. We anticipate that the benefits of drought tolerant corn hybrids could rise as water becomes more scarce. We also predict that outbreaks of spider mites and potentially other pests could become more prevalent if the climate's warm, particularly in those in regions of agriculture production like uh, northern Utah. Lastly, our 2020 field season findings suggest that effective management strategies for the generalist two-spotted spider mite could potentially differ from those tailored for the Banks grass mite, which is um, a specialist for grasses like corn. I would like to thank the following for their contributions to our research. And with that, I appreciate you viewing the presentation. We'll be happy to address your questions. And I've also tried to include um, links below for additional resources. Um, and I encourage you also to keep an eye on uh, the USU Crops uh, uh, social media for some more interesting articles and other uh, little tidbits. So with that, um, I'll be happy to take any questions and I'll try and check the um, chat bar here. Yeah, I haven't seen any questions come through the chat yet, but if anyone's got them, uh, now's the time or if you want to ask a question, that'd be great. Uh, we've got uh, two, three minutes before uh, we need to move on to the next presentation. Um, so if anyone's got those questions, go ahead and ask them now. In, uh, in the meantime, maybe we'll have you, so there's one that just popped into the chat, but uh, let's have, maybe you can stop sharing your screen and we'll have Earl start sharing while you start answering some of these questions. Okay, I'm trying to find it here. I don't know if um, you might be able to take it away. Okay. Okay, I see the question. So if I'm reading it correct, was the effect of dust monitored in the study? So we don't, uh, we haven't been using the dust itself to monitor spider mites in the study. We're looking at them under the microscope so we can count both the eggs, which are, are very small, and also the different um, life stages, including those matures. Um, I anticipate it might. Um, otherwise, though, if we were uh, using dust to just count them uh, for the purpose of these studies, 